morning, everybody. Um, to uh, Andrea and uh, uh, Alex are both back here, so I'll have seen this a little bit. For those that don't know me, I'm going to go back to downtown. I actually was back to the other two as well. Uh, but enough about me. Um, I'm here to introduce our voice and he's actually right now uh, the chair, site chair for medicine at SBI. And he is my boss. And uh, I have to say that you know, since uh, he had arrived at the IRF, I've been working with him because he has helped me and the department grow in regards to um, improving our metrics, our patient care, as well as our you know, faculty and joining in the work and itself, which is great. Um, and in addition to that, um, you know, to let you know a little bit about the course, and he first actually trained here at Mount Sinai in medicine and pediatrics. But that was around 20, 25, 20 years ago, something yeah. like that. And um, <clears throat> most recently, when he got before turning the eye, he was uh, CMO and the CEO of the United States' largest medical UCs. And in addition to that, he has also had news referrals in the city. Uh, so they might work with the Cancer Coalition for the Department of Health, as well as the state's Urban Care Association, and also um, news referrals to the uh, special needs insurance plan. And in addition to all of this, he has also had um, retained a very active primary care practice. So uh, right now, Gary is going to talk to us about um, the outpatient experience and aspects in the future of mandatory care. So uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I, um, you know, I trained here, but I've never been in the internet building until today. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a, uh, a new experience for me. Intersecting. Exactly. I'm honored to be among. Uh, so, as Ethan mentioned, um, I came back for lots of reasons, but a big, a big reason I came back, you may remember this uh, at the Sunday Times magazine a few years ago, it says the front beds are filled with means we fail. I know we're having some big questions. <laughs> so, I, I show this slide with a little trepidation, but, um, but I think the message behind the slide is. That you know, a lot of the focus in the system is completely downtown, has to be around all the stuff that they put people on to the hospital um, in terms of ambulatory care and, and care management and, uh, you know, other sort of programs to keep people out of the hospital. <laughs> Even if it's not a success, yeah, or a perfect success, it's certainly what we're working for. So, you know, when we think about the future of outpatient care and that is really about the system, a lot of that ties in with the future of the hospital. And so, you know, through, through Zijin's leadership, a lot of partner shows really how a lot of people in the hospital system have really been expanding our outpatient services downtown. Many of you know that uh, you know, the Union Square campus, what we used to call that, we call that side of downtown Union Square, um, we think is the largest outpatient center in New York State and is undergoing tremendous renovation. This is the primary care suite just before we unwrapped about two months ago. And then all of the medicine subspecialties will be moving into one more time suite uh, at the end of January. And it will be a great opportunity for all of us to be together, uh, you know, sharing practices. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm figuring out how to really grow that, uh, that outpatient footprint. Last year, we opened the respiratory institute right next door on the second floor, a beautiful collaboration with downtown and downtown. And even as we're thinking about how to build this new 70 bed state of the art hospital downtown, it's going to be focused on really kind of rapid throughput and getting the sickest people's well fast. We're really thinking about how to blur the lines between innovation and outpatient. So if we build these private rooms, everything, everyone's going to include a television monitor that's going to have uh, teleconference capabilities so that we can do. Uh, Video visits or about you know, inpatient consults by video uh, when that's the right thing for the patient. We can uh, expedite <laughs> care by getting people's specialty, specialty consultation right away. We have to figure out how to do it without like, a video tab or scaling it. That's a different, uh, different architectural issue. So I wanted to just digress for five minutes and talk about what I've spent the last 10 or so years, which is in a federally qualified public center. You know, I made it through medical school and residency, and my first job out of residency, not even knowing what a federally qualified health center was. And that's despite the fact that 
know, even up here in Upper Manhattan, we're surrounded by federally qualified health centers and subsidies. Uh, and so, you know, we're fortunate though that a lot of our residents and trainees now are actually training at Israel. We have a great collaboration with uh, the Mayan Center, with Mayan Nina, and other hospitals in the system as well uh, have collaborations at Mayan or the Institute of Family Health. And so people are getting more exposure to the FQH support right at this moment. You know, what distinguishes FQH is a couple of key factors. One is that they're located in areas of high need, so we have federally designated medically underserved areas. Number two is that they provide a comprehensive set of services, so that's primary care plus. Uh, you know, in many cases, that's things like that, behavioral health, because a large proportion of the patients have diabetes, it also often includes optometry, ophthalmology, dietary, uh, nutrition, and other kinds of services to help support the patients who are there. The board of directors for FQHCs has to be made up of at least 51% patients of the FQHC. So unlike hospital boards or other uh, other governing boards, the focus really has to be on, on the patients. And, and the patients have to be representative of the patient base as a whole. So if there's a large homeless population, there has to be a homeless representative. If there's a large HIV population, there has to be a HIV positive representative. Um, and it really changes the nature of what the <laughs> board means. Presentations uh, uh, like as you can imagine. And FHCs have to be open to everyone, regardless of documentation status or insurance status or English speaking ability. And because we're all dealing with some of these issues around immigration and documentation, um, FHCs are sort of leading the charge of thinking through how to have applications. Um, you know, FHCs started in the 1960s. Physician and activist uh, Jack Geiger, who in my hometown of Boston, opened the first FQHC. And what's been nice about them for all these years is that they've been a real bipartisan, supportive uh, organization. You know, they were starting under like LBJ and Ted Kennedy, uh, but, but some of the biggest funding came from George W. Bush, who actually doubled the funding for FQHCs and went to a huge expansion nationwide. You know, blue states, they tend to be in urban areas serving on urban poor. In red states, they tend to be the only provider of care in a lot of rural areas. So historically, there's been tremendous bipartisan support this year, actually. It's the first year where the, a lot of funding has started in the Affordable Care Act, which really uh, held up until the last minute. But in general, it's been something that everybody can, can unify, unify us. I've worked at a bunch of different FQHCs now. This is a lot of said most recently the uh, Community Healthcare Network, which is one of the state's largest. Their map has actually grown in the time uh, <coughs> after I left. Uh, but as you can see, they have uh, sites across four of the boroughs and three of medical pool bands that provide care even to places that are harder to reach. And as I mentioned, they provide care, um, not just primary care, but care for whatever um, disease states or, or supportive services the patients need. I wanted to just take a moment to highlight health homes because Mount Sinai, all the CHN has this three different health homes, one of which is in partnership with the Mount Sinai health homes. You know, people sometimes confuse health homes and medical homes, so I'll just remind you that health homes is a state Medicaid funded program for uh, care management, for sort of support care management for patients either with HIV or mental health diagnosis or two chronic illnesses, so for example, hypertension and diabetes. Um, and they get free care management through, uh, through a state funded program. So one of the successes we've had at Beth Israel in my year there so far is that we made it easier and easier for people to connect both inpatients and outpatients with the Mount Sinai Health Homes program. As of about a month ago, there's now a like three click consult form on Epic. So you can order an SHP consult, type in a one sense thing about why you think this person needs help home, and then the uh, help home program takes it from there. It's also available uptown as well. And yes. what do we, what concrete thing do we need to do to get that? So that's it. All you need to do is log into Epic, type MSHP in the order box. Mm -hmm. um, it'll pop up a, I think it's a consult to, um, to an outside help care partners. 
Um, the pre populates used to be a page long form you have to manually fill out. Now all pre populates with their insurance information and their problem list and their demographic information. Um, so remember, people have to be, have, they have to have Medicaid because it's a Medicaid sponsored program. They have to either have HIV or uh, a mental health diagnosis, including depression, or two chronic illnesses on the part of patients. That's 90% of our inpatients, and about 75% of our outpatients. Um, and that is one. Um, and then there's a there's a three star you know the hard stop fill in the blank why do you think this patient would benefit from case management and you type whatever you want in that blank you sign the order and off it goes within 24 hours the care management folks go contact you and dual eligible patients are also covered by this you have to have Medicaid yeah. yes as long as you have Medicaid you know the talk was already working great I I go <laughs> Um Alright, so FQHC served lots of I mean, one in 12 people across the country in part because of this great reach. That's one in six people on Medicaid, it's one in three people living below the poverty line, poverty line. Uh, one in 10 children across the country. There's another way of looking at that stuff. And there's, you know, in some areas there's focus on veterans, on homeless patients, on children, on uh, people on uh, uh, medication assisted therapy for opioids, etc. Et uh, you know, FQHC is because they're getting some federal funding as part of this program. They're required to report to the federal government on both the quality and financial metrics. And this is all publicly available on the website. You can also see all the reports we want. Um, and so it's easy to see for any FQHC what percentage of their patients have, for example, diabetes. Um, and there's also clinical data, so what percentage of their patients have the, the, the diabetes data is below the fold here, but um, you know you can see what percentage of patients, for example, were screened for cervical cancer and how that ranks compared to other patients. So lots of opportunity to take these publicly available data and use them both for quality improvement internally and for research purposes. Uh, and in fact, you know the national lobbying organizations compare it to seeds to all comers. And reports, you know, better diabetic control rates, better blood pressure control, better asthma education, more immunizations, better cancer screening, et cetera, et cetera, and at a lower cost. So this is a little bit old, but the per capita cost per patient per year at QHCs, um, they report lower than the average per capita cost across the country, and and really less in all these domains. You know, in lower inpatient cities, you know. Outpatient centers, uh, lower ambulatory costs, lower costs for other services. So, you know, of course, FQHCs aren't without their challenges. And I think, you know, a lot of these are challenges that, that we face in the hospital world, you know, that other practitioners face uh, in their worlds. The biggest one being workforce issues. So, 95% of FQHCs report a clinical vacancy. Most cases, it's a primary care doctor, nurse practitioner, and you know their argument is that if they could fill all those vacancies, that FQHCs could serve an additional two million more patients at that low cost, uh, high quality uh, paradigm. Why are there vacancies? I mean, for the same reasons there are vacancies in other places. You know, big issue is burnout. Um, and this you've probably seen before. This is the slide from JANA from 2012. Looks at burnout in all these different specialties, you know, general internal medicine is right there at the top. Um, medicine subspecialties are in the middle here somewhere. Um, you know, what's shocking to me about this is that even in the lowest burnout specialties like dermatology, they're still reporting rates in the 30%. So I did find. This slide is just a different database. This is Medscape, uh, this is Medscape survey data that looks at medicine specialties broken out. So diabetes and endocrinology, fortunately, is near the bottom, but still in a 39, you know, still in a 39 percent. Laughter means you don't believe it, or that's. Uh, I'm surprised it's not higher. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, like 39 percent is still high, right? I mean, you can be relatively good. And still, it's still absolutely. What time course is the burnout over? What time course is the survey from? I don't know. We're right. What were the age? Like, how long were people 
tactics where they put it out. Yeah, yeah, a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so what we did at CHM was to administer you know, one of the classic metrics for burnout, the mass lot burnout inventory, which really asks sort of three questions in three domains. So emotional exhaustion, how you know how often do I feel burned out by my work? Depersonalization, how often do you go home and say, God, I don't even care what happens? And then personal accomplishments, uh, yeah, how often do you go hard in person? How often do you go home and say, okay, I didn't want to fly to work? And not surprisingly, we found, you know, fair enough, of course, not a couple of months of primary care clinicians. Um, and why? Uh, you know, the same reasons that we see it everywhere else. So, increased clerical burden being a big one. And, you know, we tried to figure out how do we target this? How do we add to the AAA, you know, better outcomes and lower costs and an improve patient experience? And how do we turn that into a quadruple A? that adds to that the improved clinician experience. So you may have heard the story. This was uh, Don Berwick wrote this article in uh, JAMA in 2017. He starts off telling the story about a, a visiting professor at a, a business at some uh, university in Europe who, you know, during her sabbatical went there and noticed that everybody who was riding a bicycle signed in and then a log in the front desk. And not only signed in, but behind the front desk were boxes and boxes of old bicycle models. And when she asked people, like, why are you doing this, nobody had any idea. And so, because she had an inquisitive mind, she went and did some digging, and it turned out that it dates back to World War II. And when there were uh, fuel rations, they encouraged people to bike to work by having them sign a law, and they would get some sort of food coupon or something in return for doing that. So in the 40s, this made a lot of sense. And without really thinking about it, people had been continuing it for 70 years um, without ever questioning it. And so, so that's the setup for this article, which says, you know, if you could break or change any rule in your healthcare organization in the service of a better care experience for patients or for staff, what would that be? Um, and, and then how and so we took that challenge really seriously at CHN, and we set up this whole committee, the Tasks Committee, Transforming Administrative Burden, Sharing Knowledge, and Sustaining Change. We set up this like, multidisciplinary committee um, to ask those questions, and we found three things in sort of three big buckets. Like, what's the stuff we're doing, like the bicycle laws, that we don't need to be doing at all? What's the stuff that somebody else could be doing? Um, so that everybody's sort of working at the top of their devices. <clears throat> and what's the stuff that we could invest in technology to do these things? And we created a long list, um, and we started sort of things one by one. So this was sort of supporting, this was in uh, the journal a couple months ago. This is uh, getting, the article is called Getting Rid of Stupid Stuff, or gross. Um, and this was a, um, a uh, healthcare system in Hawaii that basically asked people that same reason, like, that same question, like, what stuff in our electronic medical record is stupid and how we get rid of it. And people came up with lots of suggestions, nurses more than doctors. Um, and what's amazing to me about this is that um, most of the suggestions <coughs> were either done, so 45% more than anything, and then a bunch more were in in progress or about to stuff. Um, so people had really good ideas that were implemented. And you know, we took this and you know also as a call to action that this really we're trying to think through that same thing. Like what as we're moving into beautiful new, new ambulatory space, how do we think through and, and soon beautiful new hospital space, how do we think through all the processes that we do now? And what gets in the way of efficient, uh, effective care that makes providers and other clinicians unhappy? There's not a lot of science behind this yet. And some of you may have seen AMA, uh, some Chris and Steve, who's a primary care doc in Iowa, helped uh, the AMA in partnership with the Society for General Internal Medicine launch this website called Steps Forward. They have a bunch of really interesting, very short CME granting modules that talk about some of these operational challenges and how to best uh, 
implement them. This is one of my favorites. It's about pre-visit laboratory testing. But, you know, my, my primary care colleagues are not where you tell people like to come a week before their next visit to get their A1C and lipids and stuff done. So you can talk about it at the visit instead of having to call them with their lab results after the visit or send them a letter, which creates a lot of like churn and extra work and bring them back and phone calls where you can just take care of it. Um, and, and Dr. Sinski, you know, tells me that they, they tried this out and she's heard every excuse in the book about why it doesn't work in her it doesn't work in big breaths, it doesn't work in small breaths, it doesn't work in big breaths. And they've actually tested it in all these different uh, practice models and they swear only about 2% of the time do people need to get additional blood work on the day of their uh, So there are lots of modules like that that are, that are interesting. Ways to streamline care that already exists out there. Obviously, Sinai is doing a lot right this moment. You know, uh, John Red was appointed the chief uh, wellness officer about a year ago, and there are wellness champions at, at all the sites and in, uh, in all the departments. There's a lot of individual level <laughs> interventions um, around you know mindfulness, which you know is obviously not the solution to be more at peace with all the hard work. But, 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 you know, is part of helping people deal with the chaos that is, you know, medical care in 2019. Um, because a lot of those clerical burdens are epic or EMR challenges, but there's been a lot of work on having epic champions, uh, having dictation software, and having um, one on one optimization sessions. How many people here have done one on one meeting with an epic trainer? Wow. So if you want, well, well, I can offer a one. Yeah, I'll sit down. I found this to be like the best thing that I've done since I've gotten to Sinai. Um, because it really showed me how to like optimize all my templates and workflows and how to pre-arrange stuff. Um, and um, and they already made my hair way more, or my documentation way more efficient than it was. On the primary care side, uh, the primary care institute is doing a bunch of leadership around that. Practice redesign. And as you can imagine, the primary care practices are very different all throughout the system. And so, um, you know, we go to each practice, figuring out where they're at and how to take them to the next level. It's a, you know, it's a ongoing full time job. The other big cause of all this burnout is increased expectations, specifically productivity requirements. And it was particularly challenging in CHN because about 40% of our providers were nurse practitioners. And nurse practitioners had about twice as high turnover, have about twice as high turnover rate nationwide as physicians. And there's a little bit of evidence um, for that. You know, the one of the challenges in nurse practitioner education is that it's very variable, not only across the country, but even within a given school, which preceptor you have or what experience you have in the rotations, can have a huge impact on how prepared you feel for whatever care you're going to provide after graduation. <coughs> so they surveyed it these a few years ago, only about 10% of nurse practitioners graduating from school felt well prepared to practice that after the meeting after graduation. And you can imagine that in the urban underserved setting, it's even more. Uh, complicated than that. And so what we did was create essentially a, you know, a fellowship, although it's not a function of our internship, of outpatient preceptive primary care visits, plus a bunch of rotations in specialty practices across the city, not so that they could become you know great cardiologists or, or endocrinologists, but so they would know like what's worthy of a cardiology referral, how do you make a good cardiology referral, all that stuff. So I call on some of you to help facilitate some of these um, uh, rotations. Was that part of the school? No, it's unrelated. It's our own CHN independent fellowship program. Why? Why is it independent? So it's an interesting question. I think there are some colleagues. So nationwide, we were the, I think, third fellowship program in the country. The first one was in Connecticut and also independent from any schools. Um, I think there is, it was perfect training for people who wanted to um, 
to practice the kind of medicine we were practicing, you know, very, very primary care practice. I think nurse practitioners will want to um, continue to demonstrate that they can gradually fully qualify nurse practitioners out of the school without needing additional training. And so I think there are sort of very so jurisdiction. Perhaps, yes. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for the for the nursing world or the nurse practitioner world, but I um, I think there are there are some of those problems. And so, you know, for us, that may change over time, certainly. And you know, because the applicants we got were people who were smart enough to realize what they like all board certified licensed nurse practitioners were smart enough to realize what they knew and what they didn't know and what they would need to to practice moving forward. We got really, you know, stellar applicants for this program who then you know, we could continue to hire or we would land great jobs and also Is this paid or do they pay? They got paid. You know it's like it's like internship. Basically okay. they got paid but not at the level of like right. full full time nurse practitioner because a lot of their time is spent. So based on that success, we actually ended up getting a state grant, which then we took national a little bit to look at kind of these workforce issues throughout the country for nurse practitioners and specifically for PAs to figure out how we could create um, successful models of using nurse practitioners and PAs in a uh, you know throughout the throughout the state and throughout the country to, to help with some of these workforce shortages. So changing direction now to some of the things that you know make people um, miserable in practice. And a big one is the kind of unpredictability of notion. So you know we did we did a bunch of analysis at uh, CHN just to look at our no shows in our adult population. Um, and you know I think it's most of the things that that you would expect. I mean the biggest predictor of no shows was their past history of no show. Um, so compared to people with no prior no shows, you know, people who no showed a third of the time were 2.2 times more likely to no show the next time. And and so we could pretty regularly predict who was most likely to no show and uh, just based on that alone and figure out how to figure the schedule as a result. Uh, yeah, and point point with their panel providers. So people who were seeing their regular doctor were way more likely to show than three times more likely to show than people who we said like, well, you know, your regular doctor has an appointment for a week, but we have you see this other person tomorrow, way less likely to show. So wouldn't it be the opposite then? Appointment not appointment with right. I'm sorry. Appointment appointment other than a panel. Correct. Yes, you're that is correct. Um, patient age. So. Patients between 19 and 29 are twice as likely to sh twice as likely to not show as patients who are 60 or older. Um, the appointment type, so people were more likely um, to show up for their first visit or for their physical than for a random, you know, come back and see you for a long time visit. Um, and then lead time, so there's lots of data for this. I'll show you some, some of our data in a moment. You know, the things that didn't come out of this analysis. So things like appointment time, like time of day, um, the season of the year, the time of the month. So I just had this feeling like at the beginning of the month, maybe people are less likely to show up or whatever, but none of that, none of that kind of So this is honestly the this um, real lead time data from one of our practices downtown. So I have to remind you, one of the bars is the percentage of our patients who are booked, so zero to seven, eight to six. So the red bars, I think, is the percentage of Patients were booked to that slot, and the blue bars is their percentage of no show. So you can see there's a huge gap between this is 14 days out, and these are for new patients, and this is 15 days, you know, 15 to 30 days out. The no show rate jumps from 5% to 50% just by booking people a couple of weeks out. So one of the things that you can take the lead on is figuring out how we get people more sooner appointments um, through staggering. Uh, static appointment schedules or finding, you know, or blocking schedules or finding ways to be creative about, um, about how we work. What was the end for this? I'm just curious because I'm, I'm struck by the greater than 30 days being less. 
Yeah, and for the greater, I don't know off the top of my head. It's about 100 patients per month. For the total, right? For the total patients. Right, so that's the end for over 30 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the total patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the total patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
let's just overbook more people because we know this difficulty shows up 40% of the time. But to find ways to strategically reduce the no-show rate, I think we need to think it needs to be done. So to give some context, as a, on our hospital-based clinic, our faculty practice, as well as across the endocrine systems, you and I have been working on this topic uh, yeah. for a long time. And I think, and we've thrown a book at paper, you know, we've tried every tool here. And I think if we're already at the point of discussing how to remind people, we've already, we're already behind. Yes. You have to make at the point of appointment booking, yes. you have to make it within that speed spot of 0 to 15 days. Uh, I totally agree. Because we, you can barely get seen on the phone. Right. At, if you're at the point of appointment reminders. Um, and so I think that the, the, yes, we should always be doing this, but I think our intervention should really be trying to also free up time. And maybe that's trying to identify the no-shows. We have a, we're launching in the next week a new strategy to sort of a no-mercy, um, no-show elimination <laughs> process. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. Right. I, I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I don't know all the details about the no, yeah. no mercy, no show rule, but, you know, I, It'll be amazing. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I have an intrinsic sort of concern about those kinds of things because I think, you know, in my practice, I have lots of people who no show because their next appointment is a month out and they get their work schedule a week before. And so if I book them for a Wednesday afternoon and they find out, the Friday before that they're working on Wednesday afternoon, like they can call and cancel and whatever, but if they call the call center, they're going to be told, well, you can cancel that appointment, you have to wait six weeks, but that's six weeks, the same thing. Yeah. I got patients with transportation problems, who the, you know, the transportation, um, you know, doesn't pick them up or picks them up two hours too late or picks them up two hours too early, they get dropped off two hours before their appointment, and then 20 minutes later, they're back to pick them up. Um, yesterday, I had somebody who was in the allergy practice for like three hours getting allergy tests, and so it was four hours late to my appointment. I, I, I'm sympathetic to setting high expectations, but I'm also really sympathetic to um, to figuring out when people are no showing, like why are they no showing? Some of it is our fault, right? It's our fault for booking people that far out. It's our fault for not being flexible with transportation and you know some of these other things that happen in real Lives. And sorry, one second. And so I do want to make sure that when we don't think about all no, you know, not every no show is because somebody's flaky or forgetful or whatever. But if they are, that may be something we need to intervene on too. Um, that was one answer. The other piece is, you know, the no show that I showed was for new patients. Getting new patients in, in 14 days is a real thing. But you know, I tell somebody, look, you know, take this Lantus and come back in three months. Um, they still are going to need to be reminded. Mean, I'm not going to remember when three months from now. They're still going to need to be reminded. So while I agree with you that this is a, if we're not fitting people in who need to be seen now, now that is a problem. But if we're not finding a meaningful way to remind people who are already established patients, but three months from now may need a reminder, and we're doing it in a meaningful way, so it's not the contact center making a bunch of calls, leaving voicemails that nobody's going to listen to. Us to my voicemails either. Um, we may need some of this, whether it's by robocall or call or text or something, so that people do get reminded. And I'm obviously happy to talk to you a little bit more. Questions at the front row of this discussion. But has anyone had the recklessness to consider my physics? Yes, so that's a great question. We are doing in primary care, we do night or evening and weekend visits. Showing some benefit? Yes, well, I don't know that data, maybe CJ does from, from the digital, but I can tell you at CHN when we did it, the, eight, the seven to eight or eight to nine hour in the morning definitely had a, a lower no show percentage than a bunch of the hours in the middle of the day. Um, if there's some issues with those data because like maybe it's a different, you know, it's not, they're not randomized, so maybe it's a different group of people who want to come in the morning, so it helps your percentage, but maybe it's not attacking the actual people who are having trouble getting seen. But yes, we would love to expand more night and weekend visits. Uh, the, the evening hours and the weekend hours tend to be filled with patients for sure. Yeah, right. People are appreciative. There are some issues with transportation and stuff. So you say, so in your 
practice that I ran, we, we had a three strikes and you're out rule. Yeah. So if you missed three appointments, then you, you, you couldn't be moved with the same doc. We also set up a emergency overflow clinic to, to get rid of the no-show or a day the, the no-shows with the, too many people showing up on the same day. Overflow, yeah. Right? And so the deal there was we had a position on call for half a day mm -hmm. or two days a week. And if someone was repeated no show, but then, then wanted to show and needed to show, they could come in instantly and it wouldn't be on Dr. Weissman. Right. So they would then learn that this system was there to support you. Uh, the physician's stress got better because they didn't right. have to suffer from over. And then if you've got the family, uh, you know, uh, home, home health care option, you could actually cherry pick those people. Yeah. Patient, yeah. So I agree. I mean, that's I agree that that's one of the better ways of dealing with this. Um, you know, I'm opposed to the three strikes in your out rule. Um, a because I, as much as I love baseball, I'm not convinced that using baseball analogy and analogy is the is an automatic fit. And B because of the things I said before that. You know, somebody may be missing for really good right. reasons. That's why I said And so if you have the overflow option, I agree that that is the and, solution. And also, and also, if you do the home health care intervention to find out what that particular person's issues are, right. maybe you can use that and fire these guys. Correct. I agree. I, you know, it has to be structured well, and it sounds like your practice was. You know, I've been in places where they knew that they could no show because there was this out option, and they knew that if they you know, from a patient point of view, like they might have to wait 45 minutes on the day of their appointment to see the doctor and book it, you know, six weeks in advance and it was a whole hassle. Whereas if they just came to the no-show doctor or whatever, the walk-in doctor, they could get seen right away. There's no waiting, there's no booking in advance, it was way easier. But from our point of view, they were seeing a different doctor every time and it was getting in the way of what we thought of as, um, you know, continuity and coordinated care. In some cases, you're right, that may be the only thing to do I would add that on top of that, there's probably some more nuanced evaluation we could do to figure out why those people are no-showing, because maybe there's some structural thing that we could fix. Maybe we should be getting rid of appointments all together, and, but that's not a conversation for today. But, um, but, but maybe there's some more nuanced thing where it turns out that you know transportation doesn't work well after four o'clock and we should shift everybody, you know, everybody should work from seven to four instead of from eight to five or whatever. You know, there's, there may be some trends in causes that could I, I agree with your plan and maybe there are some things we could do to reduce the no-shows at the same time. There's a question. Um, I just want to say a little bit um, more about the case. Like, um, a lot of this is getting at Yes, or like needs a reminder, but like just anecdotally, like I feel like when I talk to patients about why they didn't come to an appointment, um, it's never like they're like they don't say like, oh I didn't know or I forgot or like oh I feel well or mm -hmm. I was sick that day or my family member needed this. So like, yes. there's like bigger reasons. Um, I feel like a like a, a needs assessment almost of like yeah. I totally agree. And as we think through this, those are exactly the kinds of things we could be talking about. Like maybe it shouldn't be a contact center person who's making these calls. Maybe it should be a social worker who's saying, like, hey, you know, eighty percent of our patients are taking this appointment. You know, are you going to be able to keep this appointment? Oh no, why not? Oh, because I don't have babysitting. Oh, babysitting. Like we can find you a babysitter or whatever, and think through that. And that's also where the help home. That's I mean, that's where the help home story comes in too, because they can help triage some of those things.
buy in from the doctors in practice say, oh, Monday mornings, I don't send the patients, I know I'll get down there. So I think that's great. I want to move on because I have some even more controversial topics coming. But, <laughs> um, I agree that it's good to have walk-in availability or some sort of outlet. Um, at the same time, I don't want people to think like, oh, we have walk-in hours, so who cares what happens with the uh, appointments? Because fixing appointment show rates is really important for our own well-being. It's important for productivity. It's important for continuity care. Yeah, lots of it. I have to say one more thing about that. So yeah. If everything here I agree with 100%, walking is great, it's a brilliant idea, it's a way to help our patients, but then what do I do about that faculty member who comes to me? And I'm dealing with them because their RV is stopped because only two people showed up at that walking clinic and now they're getting dinged for that. Yes. So there has to be a balance. We're talking about physician limits as well. We all care about our patients. That's yes. why we're all here, but we have to balance it on the other side of it too to make sure that somebody that Yep. That sounds like a great last word as we move on. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the empowerment stuff, but empowerment is important. Um, I'll talk briefly about DISREP. You know, for a long time, I couldn't go to any meeting without talking about DISREP. You'll remember this is the like $8 billion program that the state got a federal waiver to take a bunch of Medicaid money and use it to give it to um, performing provider systems, mostly hospitals to help do collaborations in the community. Um, Mount Sinai is one of the bigger ones. This is, I can't remember, thousands of providers in 50 different organizations or something across the city or across that part of the city. Um, and we're, we're now entering year five of what was a five-year um, program. There's been some talk recently about extending it or doing a 2.0 version of this. Um, but the idea was to take all this money and to put it into helping people with chronic conditions do things like smoking cessation, screening for cancers, um, the adherence to their medicines, improve access by collaborations across different entities, close their care gaps and stuff like foot uh, exams and eye exams, um, and then take the highest utilizers. And you know, the overall goal was to reduce. ED visits and hospitalizations by 25% over that five year period. Um, I don't think we fit that goal, but uh, but it has created a lot of interesting programs. Um, most of it, some of which I will talk. So, so specialty care. Um, so this is out of uh, the New England Journal of Medicine from last year. You know, this you you may understand either from your specialist point of view or as a, you know, in your residency or something, if, you know, if I was sitting at CHN or an FQHC or something, and I wanted to send a person to the endocrinologist, you know, we would enter orders in, in clinical works or whatever EMR we were using, and we'd go to some referral coordinator at CHN who would help schedule the patients depending on where they were scheduling the patients. We were partnered with like 200 different organizations. Um, they would schedule a patient either directly or by faxing stuff or by calling and reading out demographics, some whole process. Um, then they would fax over some data, both clinical data and demographic data. Somebody would call the patient and tell them their appointment is a month from now because that's how far out we book appointments. And the patient would either go or not go. And we don't know how often they went, but we estimated there was only about a 30% show rate for those referrals to a bunch of the specialists. Um, and then often they would go, and because we were on different EMRs, the specialist wouldn't have access to their uh, clinical information or maybe the reason why they were there. Does that sound familiar? Just checking. Um, and so often the specialist says, like, well, we'll draw a bunch of, you know, I'll try to guess what Dr. Weiss was thinking, we'll draw a bunch of blood, we'll see you again in a month. Um, I never understood why a month if the labs come back tomorrow, but that's my own. Uh, anyway, so so that's what happens, and then often the patient doesn't show, and that whole process gets repeated. And it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare for you, but especially it's a nightmare for us to find out there. So we tried to come up with a bunch of ways to um, to sort of deal with that. I mean, one is easier booking. So this is a, a program called Referral, which was actually started by a Mount Sinai cardiologist. It's basically like an open table for specialists. So it interfaced with our clinical works. 
it knew what insurance people had, what insurance the specialist took in the case where the specialist paid for the like, premium package. You can't really see this, but there are um, I should be honest, but people watching online. Um, you know, there are actual appointment times here, and you can just click and it would upload all the demographic information about the appointment. The patients can get a text right away. You can print out a map, and it's really seamless. And most of the time, I can't remember what day I took this screenshot, but you know, there are appointments the same day if you want to see this person, and the next day if you want to see these it was really easy. Um, at Sinai, we use a competitor, which is Pareto. We don't have all those features turned on. It works sort of for some of that stuff. Um, but the same sort of idea where it helps facilitate people getting actual appointments. Um, one option, of course, is to not have the patient come in at all. And so we're doing more and more video visits. So this is me in my actual office with my iPhone right there using a camera, and Epic right there documenting. And so now we're doing a bunch of primary care visits and lots of specialty visits um, by video. Same documentation and update, same billing as if they were there in person, so they don't get charged with the facility fee if they would otherwise have gotten charged with the facility. Patients love it because they don't have to come in and take the subway and take the time off of work and sit in my waiting room. It's obviously not right for every disease and every patient and every doctor, um, but it is right for a lot of things. And I offer this option. Question? Uh, insurance companies love it. Love it. Um, this is their lower, they're usually a shorter episode, they're less complex. So they look yeah, um, I mean it depends, you can bill a level 4 by video, and you know in the case where some of our practices, you know, patients get a, a facility fee and a professional fee, and so in this case they'll get a professional fee, if the insurance companies were paying that much attention, they'd probably be happy not to be paying the facility fee now. So patients are certainly happy not to be paying the facility fee. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Question? Yeah. This is from the demo thing that, you know, it's like doctor in this little box over here, um, patient sitting in front of the shower curtain for some reason, um, and then documenting that. You know, historically telemedicine, I'm going to speed up for a moment just because we're done at 9.30, right? Okay. Um, and I want to make sure we get to meet consults. So, um, historically, telemedicine used in rural settings is like a kind of last ditch thing, but now it's really taking off in urban areas. This is data out of JAMA from last November, where you know, in urban, well served, commercially insured population, people call. We use telemedicine and a couple other services in the system. I don't want to talk about that. I'm going to skip the name of the project for a moment um, and just talk about any consults. So, you know, these are all the challenges we have, um, you know, especially in a place like CHM, like we talked about long wait time, people don't know there, what doesn't come over. So this is what people do, and like, thanks to Ron Tatler for leading this and, and making a bunch of these slides. You know, historically, you're not using the slide anymore, but I'm just going to You know, historically, the way people got around that was by curbside consults. They called their friend from medical school and asked them, um, and that's horrible, right? It's undocumented. The specialist only gets half the story. Um, who knows what people are documenting? And so we're trying to get rid of that and replace it with these consultations where a primary care doctor, I guess it doesn't have to be, enters a um, you know specific question into Epic theoretically or Epic theoretically. The specialist reviews that question and either says, like, I need more information before I can answer, or here's what I would do in that case, or I really need to see that patient. And it's incredibly successful and works in the endocrine of meeting the charge in this. If patients do need to get seen, um, you know, the, the coordinators can help facilitate those appointments. And it's worked really well. All these different specialties are already active. More coming imminently. Um, and one of these are data from September. So, you know, again, end up in about a third of the consults, I think, by that graph. About half from IMA, still a quarter or so from Union Square downtown. Um, but we're really trying to grow it. I think I have that graph coming up. 
coming up. Um, you know, in endocrine, about three quarters of the time the e-consult was met with useful feedback advice. Uh, only about a quarter of the time did they require an in-person endocrine visit. And let me tell you, from a primary care point of view, this is huge. It saves the patient, it saves me a lot of anguish, and it saves the patient even the best of circumstances where they can book an endocrine appointment you know, in a couple of weeks. They're taking time off of work, they're getting babysitting, they're um, getting transportation there, they're paying a copay, and it's still not getting an answer for a month. I can call them back tonight or tomorrow and say, look, I ran this by one of our diabetologists and, and we agree like this is the best plan. Um, so another thing doctors love, patients love, we just need to do more. We have been doing more, um, but we're still nowhere close to the bottom. Um, we do have an outside vendor, Rubicon, that is um, available for some practices for specialties that aren't on Epic yet. Um, there are pros and cons of Rubicon that we kind of skip. How do patients love all this stuff? If we're doing few reviews, which is like real time patient feedback, they get a text 10 minutes after they leave the um, office saying, I've had to like revisit your 10 for questions in a free text field. Um, so that if people don't like their visit, we can find out why right away and intervene in a way that we can't if they get, um, you know, press 80 feedback six months from now. And if they get like their visit, their feedback, we the next day email the doctor or the nurse or whoever and say, hey, you've got to recognize these patients. Um, anyway, that's our timeline and instruction. We're down to here somewhere, so we're almost done. Um, so thanks, I hope you'll join me in our journey to you know, improve patient care, um, get, the, get rid of the stupid stuff, and return joy to practice. Thank you. Got like 45 seconds for rapid fire questions. <laughs> Instagram, it's very uh, emblematic of what I've always experienced when you get from clinicians and, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of leadership and talking about these sort of changes and what might work. But I almost think we should be applying that we should be approaching it in the same way that we approach just general evidence based medicine, that we should be presenting the data, uh, even local Mount Sinai data, to the actual clinicians here to say, look, I know you have reservations about X, 